created by the Constitution. I have the courts of law in mind. Mr. Speaker, sir, because I'd earlier on submitted that Article 50 provides for, an opportunity, I mean, uh, uh, provides for the right to fair hearing, and that that fair hearing does not necessarily have to be oral, we have had practice in our Supreme Court. We are dealing with some of the most important decisions of our lifetimes, including decisions arising from presidential elections have, in all the uh, elections that we have had, had parties file submissions and their documents, and that their advocates have had an opportunity to appear before the courts to highlight those uh, uh, documents and pleadings that have been filed. In this occasion, because His Excellency, the Deputy President, has had an opportunity to present all the material that he ought to or he wanted to present, and also had the opportunity to cross-examine all the witnesses that he wanted to cross-examine, all that is left on their side is highlighting. On our part, Mr. Speaker, sir, the part of the National Assembly, so that then we are able to give progress to this matter, we are willing to take the painful decision to forego the cross-examination of His Excellency the Deputy President and only proceed with highlighting submissions in relation to the documents that we have filed before this House. It is our humble view that no prejudice would have been occasioned to His Excellency the Deputy President. Mr. Speaker, sir, we urge that that uh, if I had my learned senior colleague, Mr. Paul Mwita, senior counsel, well, he seemed to have been imploring this House to consider adjourning. Mr. Speaker, sir, let me end by drawing the attention of this court to Rule 12 of the proceedings, uh, the rules governing the proceedings currently underway. Mr. Speaker, sir, Rule 12 of those rules dictates that once the hearing has commenced, it shall proceed up to the end. It does not provide for an option for the House to adjourn. If that is the dictate, Mr. Speaker, sir, of the rule, uh, the rules governing the proceedings before this House, we urge that being a country, being an organ of a constitution that is uh, uh, that, that that is controlled by the rule of law and the constitution, you di we, you direct that we proceed with the hearing as had been planned. I am most obliged. Mr. Speaker, sir, just before uh, I leave the ground, maybe I would uh, want to invite uh, my leader, Mr. Uh, uh, Honorable James Orengo, Senior Counsel, to also just add one word before you give your directions. I am most obliged. Uh, Sorry. Mr. Speaker, just briefly, in these proceedings, we are governed by Article 145, and there is a very unique provision in Article 145 that you don't find in legislations uh, to do with even litigation in the courts. But because the makers of this constitution knew that uh, these proceedings are time-bound, there is under Article 145, sub-Article 5, a very important provision. And I think that article is not there for cosmetic value. That article is there to deal with a situation like we find ourselves in because the makers of this constitution knew that when uh, when processes are time-bound, they must be a safety valve. Article 145, sub-article 5, which applies mutatis mutandis in relation to the removal from office by way of impeachment of the deputy president, states as follows. The president, and for that matter, it should be read, the Deputy President shall they have the right to appear and be represented before the uh, Special Committee 
during its investigation. Now, the point that I want to make that not in a lot of legislation you find the right to be represented, highlighted, because the deputy president can elect to be represented either by his advocate or by him appearing in person or having both the, pre the deputy president and his advocate to appear. Now, I want to put before the Senate, because a lot of you have this problem a lot of time during the elections. If, in accordance with the election law, you are required to, 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 to subscribe your nomination papers on a certain day, and you fail it, you're running for president or deputy president, and you're told that you must present your nomination papers on a certain day, as it is there in the law, would you feign sickness and fail to represent your nomination papers on that particular day? And I can tell you, if you fail to do so, the law will not give you any accommodation. It, you'll be out, and there are a lot of decisions on this matter. I want to talk to this Senate very frankly. That uh, Senior Council Mite was basically giving evidence. He has not told us well, or if he has told us, uh, the medical is institution where the Deputy President is. But for the Deputy President to fail to bring evidence, credible evidence, before the House that has been admitted, even that evidence that has been admitted to a medical institution, we don't have it. We will rely on the evidence from my senior, uh, senior counsel, Paul Mwite. That is evidence. But in practice, I can say without a fear of contradiction, there are many times where people are represented even in medical documents, and later on they've been found to be uh, fake, if I may use that word. I think the thing that the Deputy President should have done, we should have had one of the doctors here, at least to tell us about his admission and about his condition, because up to 1.15 the Deputy President was here. He was not evacuated from here in an ambulance. And if I can give evidence from the bar, he went to his office, and again, there's no evidence that he was evacuated in an ambulance. He went to current hospital in himself to check at the hospital. So I think our constitutional duty is to live by what the Constitution requires of us. The greatest prejudice, for me, I was looking forward to course examine the deputy president. But unfortunately, the story that has been told does not include cross examination of the evidence of the deputy president, which is on record. But because we are time bound, and as my London friend Eric Gumba said, we are prepared to go by the evidence in record. The prejudice is to us the sickness of the deputy president is affecting us more because we would want to cross-examine him, but he's have, he has evidence in record which we cannot test by the way of cross-examination. And there's no assurance that on Tuesday the deputy president would be here. Finally, we can also say from, the, from, from here that there are many cases that have been filed all over, including in Malindi today. That has to do with the proceedings that are going on here. So I am in a position to say that this health condition in which the Deputy President is 
and I sympathize, may be opportunistic, in the absence of medical evidence from a doctor. It may be opportunistic. And I saw him when he came in. I'm not a doctor, but there was nothing to suggest that he, he was in the condition that Honorable Counsel has been talking about. So do the senators now turn into a jury to make a decision on the basis of evidence presented from the bar by senior counsel without no documentary proof of where the deputy president is and what elements is suffering for. I think the more important duty for this Senate is to comply with the Constitution. And we urge you to com comply with the Constitution and proceed with the hearing of this impeachment proceedings. Thank you. Senior Counsel Paul Mwiti. Mwashima Speaker, Honorable Senators, we all live in Kenya, and I would like to make this